This is great. I get, I get applause before I even said anything. You don't know what I'm going to say. It might be terrible. <laughs> and uh, um, how much time do we have, actually, just to check in with you? Uh, and I don't see a clock. So um, I just want to make sure that I don't, I could go on for like two hours probably and I'm just realizing that uh, in my office there's a couple of people who work with me here. They're responsible for helping me get, I don't know, many, many thank you notes out uh, on, a, on a weekly basis. But uh, I always need clocks up. So I'm just going to make sure what is, I'm going to adjust this. Forgive me, what is the time right now? Uh, 12.21. Okay, so... And what time are we doing lunch? Like around in an hour? Is that right? Just after one o'clock. Yeah, so, I, I, so my plan is to talk for about 25 minutes uh, about what's on my mind that hopefully is relevant to the topic that you expected me to come and talk about. And then hopefully, hopefully something that I said will stimulate a reaction from you and we'll have a little bit of conversation. And um, my goal... Uh, I will judge this talk to have been successful, and I'll come away happy if in, you know, sometime in the future, somebody, either one of you here uh, or somebody that you meet, says, oh, XYZ story, Guy Spear gave a talk at uh, Thomson Reuters, and that actually changed the way I saw, I see this, and I behaved differently. That would make me really, really happy. And by the way... I don't know if there's anybody from Thomson Reuters here, but Thomson Reuters, thank you so much for hosting this. I really appreciate it. I hear a lot of good things about your product. I have not tried it. I really hope that maybe if I say enough nice things to you that we'll, we'll try it out. Um, a good friend of mine, Ori Yal, has just started using it in Israel, and he's extremely happy with it. So, uh, And I have a friend who used to run some division of Thomson Reuters that I have an enormous amount of respect for. So delighted to be here and thank you for hosting this. Uh, so, so here's what uh, the sort of the, the bad news, the, the good news comes later. But um, uh, who here has followed this bet that Warren Buffett had with a fund of funds manager? It happened about 10 years ago. I don't actually remember the name of the guy he had the bet with. Do you remember the name? Uh, Pardon? So the idea was this guy runs a fund of funds. He said hedge funds are great, fund of funds are even better. And yeah, I can outperform. Was it the S&P that he had to outperform? Uh, and uh, they had a $1 million bet going for 10 years. Basically, whoever had outperformed the S&P versus this guy from Protégé Partners, um, if, if the S&P outperformed, um, the guy from Protégé Partners had to pay Warren Buffett, a charity nominated by Warren Buffett, $1 million, and uh, if not, the other way around. And guess what? Uh, so they, he was ahead for a little bit of the time, but the S&P trounced the fund of funds that he selected. And they were going to do the bet again, Except Warren Buffett said that he's too old and that he might die before the decade's out, so not worth doing the bet again. But, but Warren Buffett won that bet. Uh, over and above that, uh, we know that the majority of professional investors do not outperform the indices. And if we look inside this room, the brutal and unfortunate truth is that a large number, perhaps every single one of us, including me, will be provably, will, it'll be possible to prove that we did not add value in the financial services industry, in that at the cost of our fees, uh, the cost of our living, actually took away from what the investors could have gotten by simply investing in an index. That's a really scary thought, or should be a scary thought. And just in case you're interested, denial is an extremely powerful psychological phenomenon. And the vast majority of us in the industry live in a world of denial. And by the way, the guy from Protégé Partners lives in a world of denial. So I just did 20 years. I've done 20 years of Aquamarine Fund. Uh, I'm uh, so grateful that my returns this year just edged over 10% annualized for the last 10 years after all fees 
Uh, and that's approximately, I, I think it's about two percentage points better than the S&P. It's not what I set out to do. I set out to be 15%, 20%, you know, big, great hedge fund manager. But I'm enormously grateful that, uh, that I've outperformed. Uh, and, but I stood up in front of my investors in New York and I said these words, and, I, and, and they're true. I said, even with 20 years, we cannot be 100% sure if uh, I am just lucky or if I actually have skill. That's the brutal and honest truth. And any of you who've not read Nassim Taleb's book, uh, the, the Fooled by Randomness, goes into this at great length and makes the point very, very clearly. So, so that's a really scary thought, <laughs> if you ask me. And um, it's an even scarier thought, I think, when, when we look at what's going on. I have uh, um, had a conversation recently with a friend uh, in New York who basically said that uh, um, artificial intelligence is now starting to replicate a lot of the kinds of things that people like me have trained ourselves to do. And there's an argument that says that in the same way that AlphaGo is now beating the world's best Go uh, champion, um, there are, uh, that we, we may all just be incapable of um, outperforming all of the computers. So, you know, what the hell are we doing here? We should all go home, no? Uh, so, faced with that brutal reality and faced with the, I refuse, I don't want to live my life in denial. I feel like the guy at Protégé Partners is in denial. Um, what is the answer to that? And so, and I think I do have an answer and uh, gladly it's not covered in the book. So it's, it's, it's new material. Uh, and it starts with uh, a talk that I heard at my fifth year reunion uh, at Harvard Business School where there was a guy, I know the last name was Collier and I failed to remember his first name. And he basically addressed uh, the students five years out and he said, look, um, he said, I'm, I'm certain that all of you will make significant amounts of money. You're graduates of Harvard Business School, that's great. But what all of you will fail to do is that you will neglect these other aspects of your balance sheet. So he kind of said, stop thinking of your life just as a financial balance sheet and income statement and start thinking about the non-tangible aspects of your balance sheet and income statement. If we just think of, so it opened up my mind to something that has been slowly maturing is, uh, and one can describe it different ways, but uh, uh, there is, uh, the social balance sheet. Uh, and let me give an example. Uh, I'm reasonably sure uh, that I have a higher net worth than Chelsea Clinton. But who's more likely to become President of the United States or hold any high public office? It's clearly Chelsea Clinton. Chelsea Clinton, whatever one thinks of the Clinton family, politics, what have you, has an enormous amount of social capital. She has an enormous amount of recognition for who she is, the places that she's been, the relationships that she has. And the social capital that I have for whatever I've done is a lot more limited, but there's uh, social capital. You could argue there's, a, there's another, uh, maybe another bucket would be uh, family. So I, I know uh, a number of extraordinarily wealthy people who have just totally messed up families, messed, messed, messed up families. And uh, it, it's not really necessary for them, I believe. I mean, things have gotten so far that maybe they can't unwind them. But, but what has happened is that they have totally neglected to invest in their family ties. And um, you know, then you could talk about your sort of personal health, your personal psychological state, all of those good things. And um, so if we think of the CFA, we are at the CFA Society. <laughs> the CFA Society, and if you do an MBA, if you study accounting, if you study financial analyst, we all become really, really good at studying the financial aspect of things. And we all become really, really bad 
really bad at doing the other things. What Christian Claytonson, another professor at Harvard Business School, said is that what you find, it's probably true of the CFA, it's certainly true of MBAs, is that as you go to your reunions, and I'm about to go to my 25th Harvard Business School reunion, the people who don't show up are the people who neglected to invest in the other side of their balance sheet, in the non-tangible sides, and they ended up getting divorced, they ended up having broken families, they ended up not being part of a community, and then it's not so easy to come back to your reunions and to meet people from your past and tell them what happened, even though they're quite likely to be very wealthy. So, so then let me just give you another slightly depressing thought, and then I'll get hopefully onto some good news, is that we all work in, I, I don't think, I think that we all underestimate the degree to which we are hated by society. I mean, really hated. Um, I know that not one of us here thinks that we caused the financial crisis. I know that every single one of us here makes a distinction between um, uh, uh, rep rapacious investment bankers and quiet buy-side people. That's not what the world thinks. As far as the world thinks, we are all one and we are responsible. And we're the people who know how to take exams, we're the people who tended to get good grades, we're the people who tended to get selected for the better streams at schools, at universities. And then we come back and we sit in these jobs where we can provably, it, it's proven that the vast majority of do not us value, add value to society, although we all somehow, where are the customers' yachts, end up living pretty good lives ourselves. And you know, it's, I think it's a, it's a real question and this idea that we should, all of us should not have gone into finance, we should have gone into engineering or something where we can, we can do something that changes society in a, in a positive way it is an important question. So, you know, not, not a happy picture, but you know, the first step to making the world better is to recognize that. And I guess when I talk about the change that I'm sort of looking at, looking for, is that in 20 years time, because of the way we in this room choose to live our lives, uh, we end up uh, not being as hated. And so something that I've said at the at very back left, they're very shy, but we have Catherine Sefton and David Yud who both work for me, welcome to go talk to them and find out if what I'm saying here reflects what actually goes on in the office. But um, I, I literally, I've, I've said to Catherine more than, more than once, I don't know if I'll end up having added value to my investors, but I'm determined in my own small way to add value uh, to people in my life. And um, I, I do that in a very small way and I've not been a very effective at doing it. But one of the great things is that even if you try, um, uh, that's already your streets ahead of everybody else. I now want to just give you as a sort of, as a sort of examples, two people who've invested in the, um, in the uh, sort of non-financial side of the balance sheet, kind of in an industrial fashion to show how it can be done really, really well. And the first example that I want to give is um, perhaps less well known about Monish Pabrai in these circles is the Dakshana Foundation. So uh, Monish Pabrai is extremely open. It's very easy for anyone here to get a hold of his annual reports. Um, when his net worth went above $50 million, he basically committed to giving away 2% of it to charity every year. He said that when it, it went above $100 million, he would give, I think it's 3%. And to do it, he started something called the Dakshana Foundation, and I'm, I'm going to get into the specifics of it uh, in a second. But uh, on one of my earlier trips with him, traveling in India, he said something which was kind of remarkable. Well, maybe it's not so remarkable, but he said that he, he would be happy if 20 years after his death and more, if he's remembered at all, that he would be remembered not as a guy who was an American hedge fund manager, but, but, the, but not as a guy who was the Amer an American hedge fund manager, but as the guy who started the Dakshana Foundation. So I, I'm going to just take you briefly into the business model of the Dakshana Foundation. And in case you're wondering how the hell does this help me in my daily work, I believe that I can show you that it, that it does and will, and, and, and perhaps uh, you will behave differently 
uh, once I've shown you this, so bear with me. See, you think I'm going on, it's a long loop, but it comes back specifically to the work that we do in our offices as financial analysts. So um, uh, India's got lots of poor people, uh, people who live on subsistence income, sort of like less than a thousand dollars a year. India also has some of the best MITs and ETH equivalents uh, called the IITs of India. Um, uh, Bill Gates has said that if you had to uh, hire from only one school, uh, it would be the IITs of India that some of the best engineers has had have come from the IITs of India. And you can imagine to get in there as an extremely competitive exam, uh, the, the, the acceptance rate is sort of like hundreds to one, not even uh, tens to one. Uh, and it, India, a bit like the United States, has a system of positive preferences. So um, uh, if you come from basically the subsistence class, which in India is defined as scheduled castes and tribes, um, they make it easier, quite a bit easier for you to get in. So around 10% of the places at the IITs of India are reserved for scheduled castes and scheduled tribes. One of the biggest difficulties is that you can imagine people living on a subsistence income uh, are unable even to find out about the exam, let alone do the exam and get into the IITs. Worth saying that once you get into one of those IITs, everything is paid for. And once you graduate, so, so you, know, you live as a student on a stipend from the government, and then once uh, you graduate, you're earning equivalent pay scale to any engineer who works at Microsoft. You're earning 100 or 200 thousand dollars a year, uh, uh, you're earning uh, a substantial salary when you, when you graduate, and you have been lifted out of poverty. And there's great opportunity that your, uh, the people from the village where you come from and your immediate family will also, as a result, be lifted out of poverty. So the simple thing that the Dakshana Foundation does is it works very hard at identifying, through testing, uh, children growing up in extremely backward circumstances who actually have the um, intellectual horsepower to go to the IITs and then it trains them uh, for a couple of years to help them to do the exams and to get in. And just to give a sense, you know, I don't know if any of you saw the movie on Ramanujan, this Indian guy who grew up, grew up in an area where he didn't even have a pen and paper. And it turns out he's one of the world's most brilliant mathematician, mathematician. So just the idea that people are growing up in poverty doesn't mean that they're not smart. So Dakshana has been, has been running now for uh, six or seven years. And uh, the first batch of students that they trained, they trained about 40 or 50 students. Uh, there were one or two who got into the IITs. Even those who didn't get into the IITs uh, had much better outcomes than they would have had if Dakshana had not touched them. And at this point now, I believe uh, six or seven years into it, um, they've trained, uh, they've, they've, they've pushed, they've, they've prepared people, uh, more than 2,000 people for the IIT exams. They've got, I don't know, more than, more than 100 or so who've been through the IITs. And a number of those IIT students are now in um, high paying jobs. There's one actually that I met up with recently. He's an engineer at Google. So, um, uh, now just think of one of those individuals and what they think about Monish Pabrai and what they think about Dakshana. The gratitude that they have is, so if you think about when I, when I write a thank you note to somebody, the, the goal is to give that person a very, very tiny pit of joy. It's like, wow, somebody thought enough about me to spend a second to appreciate me. Think of that, that is a kind of a minuscule amount of sort of like gratitude, feel good connection. Those people, so, so what Monish has done is he's on an industrial scale, he's, first of all, he's helping people, he's helping people lift themselves out of poverty. But he is on an industrial scale, creating an enormous amount of people who are incredibly grateful that Monish Pabrai exists in the world who would do anything Monish Pabrai would ask them to do. Uh, so that's kind of like creating goodwill on an industrial scale if uh, thank you notes is kind of like on a very, very micro scale. One other short story. So uh, about two or three months ago, every year I write an annual report, I send it out to the planet, or I don't send it out to the planet anymore. I send it out to anyone FINMA allows me to send it to, which is a smaller number of people. But I still send it out to anybody who wants it, who, who I'm allowed to send it out to. And one of those people is Warren Buffett. So uh, 
three months ago, uh, it was sent to the office that we have in Boston. I, I, they, um, uh, already Hindi in Boston scans it and sends it to me. It's a three-line letter from Warren Buffett. It says, dear guy, you wrote a terrific annual report. Look at it. I can practically mem I've practically memorized the lines. Dear guy, you wrote a terrific annual report. Uh, uh, I can't remember something about my returns. You must have a lot of very happy investors. Full stop. You know. And I looked at this letter and fell to the floor and like was, my heart was palpitating and I couldn't get up for half an hour. I was blown away, just blown away. I couldn't believe it. And stop and think about this for a second. So Warren Buffett has a net worth of about $80 billion. He runs a company with about 300,000 employees. It's the assets are, I don't know what, 300 billion or so. And he's taking the time to write and he, okay, so he didn't write the letter. He told his assistant to write the letter and he just signed it. But still, he took 10 seconds to write to Guy Spear, whom he met you know, once for a lunch and it was a charity lunch. He has no obligation to do anything, anything for me. Uh, and um, uh, it, it, so, so, so I, I just want to unpack that for a second and, uh, and, and share with you what I think is going on there. So, the first thing is, I'm not that great, and I'm not that important in Warren Buffett's life. And if I am certain that if he sent me that letter, uh, I think that uh, in 2017 alone, he must have sent at least 10, if not 50, maybe even 100 or 200 letters that probably have exactly, exactly the same three lines. And I happen to know uh, Nick Sleep in London has received a similar letter, received a similar letter from Warren Buffett when, um, uh, when Nick Sleep closed down his fund. So what, what is Warren Buffett doing by doing that? And, and I've learned, you know, study the moves of the masters. Uh, when, when, you see, when you see a duffer play chess, their moves are very shallow. And uh, they, they fall apart very quickly. And when you see a master play chess, the, the moves have multiple layers of meaning, if you like. You can see it in 18 different ways. And I think that this move of sending, in this case, Guy Spear a letter, is, uh, a, 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 is, is profoundly smart by Warren Buffett. So what was Warren Buffett doing? He was saying, you know what? Guy's not such a terrible guy. He doesn't have Omaha numbers, but he's not ripping off his clients. And um, if I send him this letter, first of all, it's a nice thing to do for him. He'll be, and, and then Guy Spear is going to remember me, if he doesn't already, for the rest of his life. He's going to be grateful to me because I've done something for him that, that is, is priceless and nobody else can do and is just off the charts. There's no amount of price that you can put on it. And if we just go back to Dakshana for a second, think of the guy who was lifted out of poverty who now works at his en at his, as an engineer in Google. What Monish Pabrai, what Dakshana has done for that guy is similarly priceless. There's nothing that that guy can do that can, can even start to reciprocate the gratitude that that guy feels. I mean, it changed his life. Uh, and, um, but if we go back to, so, so this weekend I was in Spain. I met a Mexican guy who has a set of auto dealerships and um, apparently Berkshire Hathaway, according to what this guy told me, is very interested in buying it. And he's a fa it's a family business and he's kind of worried about, he wants various members of the family to continue to have jobs after he's sold it, but he's not actually interested in owning it for much longer. And you can imagine, he mentions Berkshire Hathaway and Warren Buffett, and I jump up and down, and I say, oh, I go to his, Berkshire, his meetings every year, and I've studied the guy inside out. Actually, I had a charity lunch with him, and believe me, uh, if uh, I know that that promise is good. He will buy your business, and he will leave the people in there, including your family, to run it. That's how he's built up Berkshire Hathaway. In fact, I would be so happy to make sure that you speak to him because I could introduce you to his assistant. And um, you know, I know this guy who also sold his business to Warren Buffett and his family still work in the business. So you, I was there happily doing an extraordinary sales job for Warren Buffett 
and Berkshire Hathaway to help it to buy his business. And I said to the guy, this Mexican guy, I said, I said, by the way, you just need to know, they pay rock bottom prices. You're not going to sell it for a high price. But what you, you so, so it's going to be an incredible deal for Berkshire Hathaway. But what you don't need the money. What you care about is that your children have jobs for the next 30 years. And he was like. At the end of this event that I was at, he said, you know, I think I'm going to get back to them. And I was like, yes, yes. And, you know, the only thing that I'm hoping for is that that deal goes through so that I can, so that Warren, the, I don't even, I just want Warren Buffett to know that I had some help in doing that, that I'd provided some help. So just, you know, when you think of what Warren Buffett did for me, and now you expand that out to 50 or 60 people PR, uh, that's uh, you, you start seeing how that can can compound to something quite extraordinary. So, you know, uh, I've I think that Catherine and David already heard this, but within within two or three weeks, uh, I had printed out every single manager letter that I'd received in my email inbox, uh, which is quite a number uh, uh, in the last two years, and um, I uh, um, uh, I printed out every single one. I read one reread some of them again. I took about half that I thought were really not very good, uh, and I discarded those. But the other half, every single guy got a similar kind of letter from me, which basically said, hey, I read your letter. It appeared in my email inbox. And I really, I, I, thought, I thought you did a great job, and I'm really impressed with your return. So um, what was I doing? I was applying what I'd learned from Warren Buffett. So how does all this affect our world of investing? And, and now I'm just going to sort of sum up um, what I think uh, these two stories mean and how investing in the non-financial side of our balance sheet is absolutely profoundly important for us to do. So um, uh, in the book, I write about all these cutesy sort of techniques like switching off the Reuters monitor who, because of the other word beginning with B is, who knows about that here. Uh, I talk about not um, you know, doing the research in the right order. I talk about all these kind of like um, sort of introverted kind of things that one can do in order to improve one's decision making. Don't put orders into the market when the market is open. If you buy something, don't sell it for a couple of years. Do the research in the right order. So I, I've just, so, so here's the, the two updates on that. The first is that um, I've learned, and I write about this in my last annual report, that there are two states of mind that one needs, I think, in order to do the investment research and management job well. The de portfolio decision making is something that should be take place from a, a place of calmness, uh, sort of like maybe a farmer mentality or, or, the, or the crop gatherer mentality where you're watching your crops grow, you're sitting meditating in the room, examining the facts, thinking about stuff. That is the right state of mind, perhaps a lean back mode. And that's what I describe in the book and that's what I was hoping to achieve by coming to Zurich, separating my work office from my library. But then there's another mode that I uh, did not talk about at all and that is, you know, extreme hunter alpha mode where you're going after facts. Uh, there's, there's a guy here who's, um, I think you're, he, uh, his name is Elad Benam. He, he's actually a very impressive guy. Uh, uh, is former now? Is it former? End of month. So you're on gardening leave. So, so I, I, so Elad, you need to go talk to him afterwards. Um, uh, talk to him rather than me. They, the so activists on the Swiss market, I met him through a guy who's the ultimate, a, a, a mutual friend called Chris Detweiler, who's the ultimate hunter of insights and information about companies and about investment situations. So in order to, so the, the second mode is, you know, extreme hunter, go after facts, interview management, go visit the site, read to the nth degree, find the consultant, talk to them, gather that all up. That's the way you want to be when you're learning about an investment situation. But then you need to be able to go back into sort of hangback mode, 
in order to actually make investment decisions. And it's quite possible that those two are very hard to have existing in one person. And the way I talk about it in the, in the annual report is that this was the problem that some companies had with Valiant. So the, the, the analyst who was chasing after insight and information kind of became the portfolio manager. Um, so, uh, so, so to tie it together, this, what I talked about Dakshana Foundation and Monish Pabrai, sooner or later, one of the thousands of the graduates that are coming out of uh, hundreds now, it'll eventually be thousands, are going to feel compelled to tell Monish Pabrai about an extraordinary investment idea. Or Monish Pabrai is going to happen across uh, a, um, one of the Dakshana uh, graduates, and they're going to be enormously helpful to him in getting insights that the rest of the world do doesn't have. We saw, I described a little bit, that same process with Warren Buffett. And I would argue uh, that what we need to do is, what I need to do is to start investing heavily in my social capital, helping people like Elad land in the best possible place, helping people like Chris, Chris Detweiler do the best possible investment research, finding um, people who write letters and letting them know that I thought it was a good letter, investing in my social capital because at the end of the day that may end up being the only competitive advantage that I have when it comes to generating better investment returns. And the good news is that even if uh, I fail to generate uh, um, market beating returns and I have to shut myself out of the industry and leave, at least I'll have a bunch of people who are grateful that I've existed in the world. And I think that if we do that collectively as an industry, uh, maybe we can re rehabilitate the industry a little bit in the minds of the general public. Uh, and at the end of the day, we did come into this industry for the money. Uh, there are plenty of other things that we could do that don't pay all that much money. Uh, but, but I think that we need to do a much better job of delivering value to the people around us and, and perhaps also in the Dakshana mode, delivering value to society. So uh, I could continue, but I'd probably be rambling. So I'm going to stop. And hopefully, hopefully somebody's going to be um, motivated to, to continue the discussion. How long have we been talking for? 40 minutes? Yeah. So, um, and 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 you know I could also I could I could often cold call I could also cold call one of one of one of the Aquarine employees I'm getting <laughs> I got no's from the audience but um, yeah so I hope that's helpful useful you know so so Christian are you really going to ask the first question no I, maybe I do have to go ahead well, if everybody else is too shy yeah uh, things to connect to yeah. Um, uh, one is really, uh, really very pleased that you mentioned the social capital because uh, just just because the, the CFA society is all about that, enabling uh, ways for our members to to, uh, to to leverage that and, and give the, the channels so provide facilitate uh, the channels to do that. So thank you very much for that. Uh, but the actual question I was having, Alex mentioned that from your uh, talk with Warren Buffett. After that, you decided to come to Switzerland. Yeah. What's the connection there? Uh, yeah, there's a huge connection. I mean, um, I asked him the question. I, it was one of the questions I asked him at lunch. I said, you know, I'm thinking about maybe moving to Zurich. What do you think about that? You know, as if Warren Buffett should know where the guy Spear should move to Zurich. And, and he, he said, well, look, you know that you can do this business from anywhere. If you like Zurich, go to Zurich, was his kind of nonplussed answer. But, but I think that the lunch, so, um, you know, another way in, Warren, in which Warren Buffett sort of invested in his social capital, if I just go back for a second, I, I've said this to so many people, but two years ago at the Berkshire meeting, Charlie Munger said something which really stuck with me, which was that he said that, so, you know, we have to realize these are two billionaires who are in their 90s, but, um, or 80s and 90s, but he, so Charlie Munger says a lot of people um, who, who get to be billionaires stop doing many of the things that got them there. And he said that one of the things that he'd noticed as a personality in Warren Buffett is that he's conti he continued to do the thing. So the fact that he's got $80 billion and he still finds it interesting to write a letter to Guy Spear, he's still investing in his social capital. He's still investing in the ties uh, his ties between not just the people who's close to him, but people who are very distant from him. Um, 
but so so and and so and and at the lunch, um, it was it was startling to see a guy. So Tim Cook uh, does has done uh, charity auctions at uh, Apple. But the, the Tim Cook charity auction, it just shows a different culture. No disrespect to Tim Cook, but it's like meet him for half an hour at uh, the coffee shop or in the, in the canteen at the Apple campus. Contrast that with Warren Buffett, which is, oh, you, you, I'm doing a charity lunch with you. This is unlimited time, and it's not in a canteen. It's a private room in a, or a semi-private room in a restaurant, and, uh, and I'm going to give you my... Uh, full, full attention. And he was like, he came, there was nothing else on his mind other than to please the people that he was meeting for lunch with. And that's kind of like a startling feeling. It's just like, oh my God, I can't believe this. And it's not natural. It's not what you would expect. I, I'm pretty certain Donald Trump wouldn't do that, you know? Um, uh, so, so what did that do? You know, I, I, I sort of saw that in, in close observation of the guy, that this guy really doesn't do things that he doesn't want to do. And he really is a, a very, very simple guy who's looking to enjoy his life. And it so happens that in this human, to enjoy his life is to do the things that he does. And a lot of that means sitting in a room where the, where the windows have been blinded out and reading any reports. But it, it gave me the courage as if I needed to go on a char expensive charity lunch to do it, the courage to say, wait, if this guy is doing it, it's not like he started his career and said, well, I have to be like this and like this, I have to wear a tie, I have to go. No, he said, I'm excited about doing this. And the goal for me was not to find the excitement that Warren Buffett found, but to find my own excited, excitement or the own things that interested me. And I realized it helped me to see very, very clearly an answer to your question that I was hankering after stuff and I was kind of following what was expected of me and what I, in a certain way I'd been taught to expect of myself to be sort of like a successful finance guy in New York. And one of the things that my wife and I love to do is to travel and to try new places and to check them out. And so that gave me the courage to do it. I realized that that was more important. And I would tell you that something that I still struggle with but I think that I'm probably on the right side of it. Charlie Munger said that once you have a certain amount of money, to go after more money is completely and utterly nuts. Why on earth would you do it? Unless the process of do going after that extra money actually is fun for you. And I think in the case of Warren Buffett, going, taking his net worth from 1 billion to 80 billion, it's just he enjoys the process. He really doesn't care about the money. And as we know, he's giving practically all of it away. And so, um, uh, meaning for me at that point was to move to Zurich, and I'm, I'm so glad I did it, but a long way to answer a short question. Um, but uh, I am going to call you, so, so, so David, am I any different in the office? <laughs> One word answer from a mathematician at Zurich University. So, <laughs> you know, I kind of, David and Catherine didn't want to come here. I was like, of course you're coming, damn it. <laughs> it's like the, the office actually is like, is a five minute walk away. And uh, it's good, it's good for me. Cause you know, if, if, if Catherine and David weren't here, I could sell you guys one story and be very, very different in the office. And hopefully I'm the same in both places. But uh, what do you think, Elad? <laughs> I think you're very good. <laughs> so, um, yeah, you know it's fine. I, I'm, you know, in Zurich, in, in Geneva, I got more more questions than in Zurich. What's going on? What's there? We go. <laughs> or should we just? Um, I'd actually be interested in a bit more. Um, you alluded in, in your final remarks about kind of your alpha hunter um, yeah. side of, of your professional personality. So um, obviously, I assume that. Besides, kind of checking the facts and and you know reading public statements, financial statements, there is a lot of kind of um, you know speaking to people and, and trying to to read between the lines and, and connecting the dots. So when it comes to your investment decisions, and just if you had to weight them percentage-wise, how important is the the factual? bit that is available in the public domain and how important is 
the additional work you do in terms of you know talking to to insiders and trying to to find out more than you can read from the numbers. So, so thanks for the question. It's a, it's a great question. And so now what you're going to get is my attempt to be intelligent about a very important topic that you've asked about. Let's bear in mind, given what I said at the very beginning of this talk, that um, the mere fact that I'm about to give you an answer to that question doesn't mean that I know what I'm talking about. <laughs> Just think about that for a second. Uh, <laughs> yeah, so, so you and me together, you know, <laughs> we'll figure this out, or we'll try and figure it out. But um, and, and and why part of why I say that is I just uh, I, I think that as an industry we should get away from people who pretend to know what they're talking about when they don't. You know, let's be honest with ourselves and let's be honest with uh, the society that we we participate in. So. Um, something that, that motivates me an awful lot, or, or I think about a lot when I get asked that question, is when Warren Buffett got asked that question, he just said, well, he starts with the A's and moves along. And I, I don't think that means he actually starts with the A's. But I think that, that, that what, the way, what I interpret that is that you have to try everything. Uh, so somebody says, oh, well, we screen, or we have great relationships, or we are experts in this or that industry. Uh, you have to try everything um, intelligently. So don't keep doing stuff that is unlikely to yield results. Um, so, and I think that the investment environment changes. What I was operating in 20 years ago is not the investment environment of today. And so, again, if you're going to try and succeed, you're going to have to adapt your methodology and what you're up to to uh, the changing environment. So I actually think we know that uh, Ben Graham, straight after the market crash of the 1930s, had a great time simply looking for companies that were trading at less than uh, networking capital. And if you were to do that now, you'd only, you know, 98 to 99% of what would come up, I've got a good shaking head over there, would be value traps. So uh, you, know, you have to update your methodology. Uh, and so, and I've, I've had the hardest time trying to figure out what is, is the right way to approach the world today. Uh, and um, uh, the, so, so the, the best, so you want to kind of start looking in the places where you're more likely to find value. You might be interested to know, Catherine's going to cringe, we've been spending the last year trying to get, I used to have a license to invest in India, uh, we've been spending the last year trying to get relicensed to invest in India, eventually we'll get it, but um, I think that there is, so, so to continue to look in, I guess, what, what, what one would call frontier markets, I'm hoping that if, if I start digging in you know, the frontier aspect of India, not the blue chip aspect of India, I'm going to come across stuff. And I took one trip with Monish. I hope to take other trips with him. Uh, I actually have started, I started yesterday buying something that is traded on the New York Stock Exchange in these overvalued days. And I can tell you how I, how I got to that. And... Um, so two years ago, I was the very unfortunate participant in a bankruptcy process where I had a 100% loss in my portfolio. But in the process, I learned quite a bit about bankruptcy and I learned quite a bit about what happens to companies when they go into distress and what that cycle looks like and uh, the kinds of fears that exist in other people when a company goes into distress or might go into distress. And uh, so about three months ago, I made a relatively small investment into a company where it was just, uh, it was misunderstood. There was a subsidiary that people thought it was a, that people thought would, would get dragged into the bankruptcy, but it was clear if you read the, the documents that it wasn't going to get dragged into bankruptcy. And so um, there was an opportunity to buy an undervalued security for understandable reasons. Uh, and in the most recent case, uh, the company has gone through a recapitalization to prevent it from going into bankruptcy, and the market hasn't noticed yet. And, and the recapitalization is everything. There's no danger at all of any kind of distress anymore at that company, but it's trading at distress levels. And how did I, how did I find that? Uh, I, 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 every now and then, I go into my, um, hopefully to be Thomson Reuters monitor, 
and uh, I, I set up some screens and I tinker and play with the screens and I look at them and I, in all honesty I think that when I've set up screens I almost never find something great. Uh, there's always something profoundly wrong with whatever it is that I've found. It screens well. There's a concept that you will read on the Van Du Investors Club website. Oh yeah, that's a stock that screens well, meaning it pops up on a screen, but the stuff that really makes it a horrible investment is totally hidden and you'd have to dig very hard to find it. I think that, that when I come across an idea that, that I'm confident to invest in the portfolio, it's a combination of what I've read in the materials, but the, not, not the result of a conversation where somebody says, oh, I'm buying XYZ stock, I think you should take a look at it. But an insight that I get from a conversation where the person I'm talking to is not even aware of the insight that I'm getting. Uh, and, but I, and, and so I don't know if that's uh, helpful, but I, I feel like I've become much more attuned to a circumstance, a set of circumstances where I can say, I can understand why it's cheap, I can understand why people aren't buying right now, and I can understand why the odds are heavily stacked in my favor if I buy right now, I'll get into it. But in terms of exact process, it's at the end of the day a result of conversations, but not conversations where somebody's saying you should buy this stock. And I guess, you know, I try hard. So, so one question that I really forget to ask that I wish I asked people more often, anybody who's a participant in any industry is just who do you admire in your industry? Simple as that. Or the way Warren Buffett describes it is if you had a silver bullet, which of your competitors would you want to get rid of? And when you talk to enough participants in an industry, you'll start getting a good idea about who's really doing stuff that is not kind of measurable in terms of the results that are coming out. Uh, through the financials. And uh, you know, another aspect of that is really working hard to add value in people's lives and in the lives of people who have insight so that, so that ideas get shared back to me. But it, again, it's not like, oh, I'm buying this stock, it's a good idea to buy it. It's about having deep, interesting conversations about what's going on in different industries. Uh, I think that that was related to your question. How have I done? Uh, you, you were missing the percentages, but what percentage? Wait, no, no, go ahead. No, no, nail me down. Come on, let's. That's uh, what? No, 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 kind of. How, how much of a decision is driven by kind of, you know, the more, um, say, financial analyst type of work, and how much is driven by intuition or speaking to people and, and kind of. Yeah. So. You know, it's worth saying, so, so we have to make sure not to upset our hosts. <laughs> um, what is it? Somebody who knows the price of everything and the value of nothing? Uh, I, don't know that, that, where, yeah, where do, I don't know where that comes from. But, but you know, the more what you, fo you move towards what you focus on. And let's just, so, so I don't think this is insulting to the CFA, but the CFA gives an extraordinary valuable qualification by making us jump through hoops. It makes us jump through hoops that are related to investment analysis and research. Uh, but in a certain way, the whole process says, are you serious about this? How much do you want it? Are you ready to commit to do what you need to do to get through the other side of this? But so, so I believe that the, the places where I've made the most money where the investment decision has been the best possible investment decision, the financial analysis was you know, one that a five-year-old could do. It was not hard. That is not the challenging part. And uh, many financial analysts have a terrible bias in that we tend to be good with numbers. And so you, know, you move towards what you know and what you like. And so we want to play with numbers. And you know, how much, you know, there's nothing as dangerous as an MBA with a spreadsheet. You know, it's like, it's like so, um, yeah, so, so, so the long answer is a very, very small amount. And there's a guy, I now have completely forgotten his name. He was an English major, doesn't have, not particularly numerate, but a very, very successful investor. And I think that it would behoove all of us once we get the CFA and we have that nice qualification to kind of forget it all and, and to start you know, focusing on people. There's a guy and hopefully I'll remember his name, Bavaria Capital, 
that I'm deeply impressed with. He comes to my Value X conference every year. Um, and uh, it's a publicly traded company. He goes away and does Vipassana meditation for 10 days in the month. And um, I think that probably has helps his investing an awful lot. So the financial analysis, analysis, I think, is a very small part of it. If you have doubt, there is no doubt. If you have to do more analysis on the thing, if you have to go torture some numbers in a spreadsheet, it's probably not cheap enough. It's probably worth moving on, or it's probably there's something wrong with it. So, yeah. Uh, in the back and then in the front, so. Has it become much more difficult, I mean, finding alpha, uh, given that, I mean, uh, let's say, uh, inside knowledge is not as uh, freely given out anymore as it, as it used to be? So first of all, I would argue I've never operated on in insider knowledge for what it's worth. Um, I think that the maybe what we can say is insights. I don't know. I don't know if I believe it or not. Some, some of the artificial intelligence people would say that the insights that were, are available through publicly available information are being arbitraged away by automated systems and that the automated systems are becoming better and better and leaving less and less space for people like me to operate. Um, uh, you know, I just want to reiterate what I said before I was answering the last question. Please don't assume that I actually know how to find alpha. I might just be a fluke. You know, we have to be aware of that. Just think that Nassim Taleb is in the room watching us. Let's not pretend. Um, but so, so every time, and then we have this extraordinary statement. I don't know who saw it. David Einhorn. If this is true, I, I, I saw it on my iPhone yesterday on the train back from Geneva. Um, so David Einhorn said that in a world of Tesla and he used another company, maybe value investing is dead. You know, that David Einhorn is a super smart guy. I, I, I really don't want to believe that he said that, but maybe that he, he did. And every time I think, so, so Warren Buffett is holding on to an enormous amount of capital. Warren Buffett believes that sooner or later he'll get chance, the chance to put that capital to work. Uh, in periods of exuberance, people think that something's come to an end, and then a dislocation happens. And um, so I think that we might just be in a period where it's hard to find what you called, quote, alpha. Uh, but, that, but I don't think it's, I think, I believe. So I have no freaking evidence to give you. I cannot prove to you. But I believe that the world goes in cycles. I believe that uh, artificial intelligence will not compete away the core of what we do. I believe that we'll come across a period where there are extraordinary values. And that what will prevent the majority of us in the room from acting will not just be the psychology. It will be very scary. will be that we don't have the money to do it uh, because, because, the, because we need people who are willing to invest with us before we can invest in whatever opportunity is being created. Rambling answer. I'm feeling a little rambly today. I apologize, but uh, I hope that's helpful. Should we make this the last question or we're, we're getting, is this the, uh, the last unless uh, last chance to ask a question, raise your hand or this is the last question. Yes, yeah, it's just kind of picking up on that. So if you had to do it again, you were fresh out of public business school. Would you start an actively managed fund today, or do you think that's just, it's just too hard, there are just better opportunities around? And as a follow-on question, I would also ask you to like to recommend some books. Besides yeah, that. yeah. Um, so if I was graduating Harvard Business School again, I would not go to work for the place that I work, D.H. Blair. I went to work for a place that was not dissimilar to Wolf of Wall Street. It was a very stupid move. We can get into why I did that. I really sort of trashed my resume and my reputation at the very beginning of my career in a way that was really stupid. Uh, and um, why I did that is um, something that I still ask myself today. Whether I would get into, you know, I, I think there's a very strong argument that half of us, that it's a free world, so we can go work wherever we like. But half or more of us should actually be in um, engineering of one kind or another. We should be working for Google, Microsoft. We should be uh, doing startups, all of those things. I, I wonder if, if I was graduating business school again, if I might not have uh, gone into that world, which I think is just such an extraordinary world right now, which is also making our life very difficult. Um, and I think that I should, you know, the, one of the most, uh, 
um, difficult things that somebody said to me. So, so a friend of mine from business school is this guy, um, Mark Pincus, who uh, started a number of companies, the most recent one being Zinger Games, of which he just stopped being the CEO. And he, and he said something, he said, look, guy, yeah, you can go and become an investor and you know, you'll make a little money, a lot of money, whatever it is, you're gonna have a reasonably nice life, but I'm here changing the world. And that's a level of excitement and reward that you're never gonna get doing what you do. And it, it gave me uh, significant pauses for thought. Now, I'm not sure that making Candy Crush is a significant way to change the world, but, but not everybody's making Candy Crush. And I just cracked open a book by a guy called David Rose who talks, talking about uh, um, sort of in, how the, sto the world of entertainment and storytelling and gaming are merging. So these total immersion uh, sort of experiences like, he started off with Grand Theft Auto, which I've never played in my life, and uh, where, where the world of movies and games is merging and it's kind of turning us into kind of a new kind of civilization. I just think that maybe, maybe I, I that, that, you know, I think that I would have given that a really, really strong shot before I would have gotten into being an, a value investor, I think. Uh, but it's worth saying that I think that um, I'm living a very happy life and it suits me to be doing what I'm doing. And uh, it fits with my personality and my psychology. Uh, books, have you, have, has, who's read the Yuval Hariri books? Uh, Homo Deus, I, I just think that that's, those, those are the best books. That, that book is the best book that I've read recently. A friend, Rolf Tabelli, has just come out with the book, The Art of Happiness. I've not yet read it. Uh, the, it's only in German edition right now. Uh, in it, uh, and I haven't got to that part, but he gave a talk. He, 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 he makes a really valuable analogy, uh, or he, he makes a statement that actually value investing is an aspect of Stoic philosophy. What we're actually doing is we're reviving Stoic philosophy in a practical way for a modern world. Um, I'm reading Philip Roth right now. I'm <laughs> every man. And um, the last, you know, there's a book that's, that's next to my bed that, I, that Monish Pabrai sent me, Tetlow, The Art of Forecasting, which I thought was very interesting. Um, Ubiquity. Has anybody read Ubiquity here? So I think that the whole the whole world of um, complex adaptive systems. So does any everybody know the sand pile model? Uh, so so this the sand pile model. So I'm a member of a club called Latticework. Uh, it's called Latticework because Charlie Munger talks about a latticework of mental models. We need to approach the world with a bunch of mental models in order to help interpret what's going on. The sand pile model should be in every one of our uh, mental models. Um, it's, um, the idea is, is that uh, if you take, and I'll stop with this because we could get into a whole other discussion here. Um, if you take a sand pile uh, or you take, take sand and you stop dropping uh, sand into a pile, obviously you'll get a little mountain of sand and every now and then there'll be avalanches, mini avalanches, so as the pile gets deeper and steeper you'll get avalanches and then it'll get flatter and flatter and uh, the first point at which avalanche, avalanches start on this little sand pile is uh, would be called the critical state. Uh, if you measure the frequency and size of those avalanches it turns, turns out that um, uh, they, they follow what is called a power law. You have a very large number of small avalanches, a very small number of big avalanches. Uh, and it's impossible to predict whether uh, um, a small avalanche, an av when an avalanche starts, if it'll be big or small. It turns out that there are so many phenomena in the world that follow a similar idea. So one is if you, if you plot the number of wars by frequency and number of people killed. That also follows a power law. If you plot earthquakes around a fault, it follows a power law. And uh, you, if, you, if you look at the stock market in a certain way, it also fo follows a power law. The idea being that, that there are so many th systems in the world that get into a critical state, at which point it's impossible to predict when there'll be, let's say, a big market crash or a small market crash. 
It's a fascinating book. I don't know how the hell to apply it to investing, but, but I know it's really important. So. <laughs> and on that happy note, thank you very much for coming. So. <laughs>